Hannah. We're going to show a couple of videos first to kind of get us in the mindset and get everyone thinking about what we're going to talk about today. So let's roll those videos. Alfalfa in the seeding year is very low production, while corn silage produces a lot. So a lot of farmers are trying to produce just corn monoculture because they lose almost like a year with alfalfa in the field. But alfalfa is a fantastic crop. It's the queen of the, of the crops because it fixes nitrogen, it's a perennial. It does a lot of good things to the soil. So if we can get alfalfa established while growing corn, by the next year, the, the alfalfa is already established alfalfa. This system, we are planting both crops at the same time. Both the corn and the alfalfa are run already. So you can use glyphosate throughout the season. Where we didn't use a leaf hopper resistant variety, we had to spray for leaf hoppers, otherwise the alfalfa would completely defoliate and lose all their leaves. When you have alfalfa in between the corn, it is a lot of competition. Alfalfa uses a lot of water. It is very likely corn yield, the grain yield, will decrease. We've seen 30 bushels of loss in yield. But then next year you gain about two and a half tons of alfalfa. Now we're hoping that with the 60 inch corn, we're gonna get a better established alfalfa and maybe not as much reduction on the corn yield as we saw with the other one and hopefully with the same benefits to the soil. looking at stock density, so the number of animals per acre, and also utilization rates are the amount of residue that we're gonna be leaving behind when we're finished grazing. We have two treatments that have 28 cows, and so the high stock density, we have three cows per acre versus our moderate stock density where we have one and a half cows per acre. All these treatments have the same docking rate. The difference is that the ones with the lower stock density are gonna be grazed for a longer period of time, where the ones with the high stock density are gonna be grazed for half the time because they have double the animals. So that's a really important management decision that farmers and ranchers need to make when they are gonna graze their cover crops. The other management decision is how much residue do we wanna leave behind and what's the impacts of all of this on soil health. We're gonna graze this as a full season cover crop this year and next year. And then the following year, we're gonna put a cash crop of corn in and look at the economic savings and benefits of that corn in addition to the economics component of our livestock production. So we're looking at two utilization rates. We're looking at a take half, leave half, which is a 35% utilization of the available forage. And then we're looking at a full use which is calculated with a 50% utilization of the available forage. As a producer, you maybe you don't wanna do all those calculations. You can just, you know, monitoring and making sure that you're moving your cows and taking them off at the appropriate time. And so these sites, we're visiting them a lot, just depending on when the cows need to be moved. And we're moving these cows anywhere from three days to every week. This project's gonna give us a better understanding of how grazing management within our cover crop systems influences our soil health, and also give us an idea of, of scalability and what will work for different farmers and ranchers in North Dakota. That was an introduction to a couple of us. Um, so let's get to know the, uh, our other panelists a little better, um, Maricel and Erin. Yeah, I'm a professor in the Department of Plant Sciences and I work on forages, cover crops, and biomass crop production research. And I also teach the forages class here. I am Erin and I work uh, as a rangeland research specialist with Central Grasslands Research Extension Center. And that's located near Strader. Uh, but I'm also a farmer and a rancher. And so regardless of whatever hat I'm wearing, um, depending on the day, I'm just really interested in learning about 
the resources that we manage and trying to address things as if we are a part of that process and a part of that system. And so a lot of my work is focused on grazing systems and improving those efficiencies, um, but I also have experience with other forages like cover crops um, and learning that the health of our soil or the lack thereof should really be a driver in our decision making as land managers. And so Aaron, where's where's your ranch? Uh, where do you guys have your ranch? We're in the southwestern part of the state in Grant County, North Dakota, uh, near Lemon, South Dakota, actually. So let's start with the questioning. I'm, I'm kind of going to be the sidekick here because I don't work a lot with, with livestock and with grazing. So um, someone asked a lot of the questions, but Miranda, you know, in your video, you shared some thoughts on setting goals for grazing intensity and, and we'll be looking at how that may influence soil health and crop yields. Um, so this is, you know, a little bit diving a little bit deeper into that. Do you think that the benefits of cover crops and grazing only come with full season cover crops or can we see some of those benefits with late season cover crops as well? I think you can see regardless of the system that you're grazing that in, in incorporating cattle or livestock is you're going to see some benefits um, just because livestock help facilitate the breakdown of those nutrients faster and also we can use livestock if we manage them um, we can improve distribution of those nutrients across that field by things like tools like strip grazing our stock density um, so regardless if that's a full season uh, cover crop or if it's a fall cereal that you're grazing in the spring, there's still going to be a benefit. Erin, with your work at Central Grasslands, and I know you're part of the SARE project that I talked about in my video, and on your ranch, what are your thoughts or what have you seen for soil health benefits when incorporating livestock? Yeah, so a lot of the work that I've done has, has actually been focused on those full season cover crops that Abby mentioned. Um, and part of that decision was to potentially achieve as many soil health benefits as possible, or at least to maximize the type of soil health benefits that we were aiming for. And a lot of that stems from our species selection. Um, so do I think that cover crops have to be incorporated as a full season cover crop? No, I think there's a lot of variables that come into play when you make that decision as a producer. Uh, for example, where we're located, as I mentioned, in the southwest part of the state, we really just don't have enough moisture to be able to support a double crop system on an annual basis. But there might be an odd year in which choosing some type of a late, um, a later season crop, whether it's rye or looking at a winter cereal even, and bringing that into the rotation might be useful for that crop season. So in North Dakota, I think the variable amount of rainfall really drives your, your choice when you're thinking about how to include cover crops into the system. Um, like I mentioned earlier, species selection, which I think Marisol will talk about, it's an important factor when it comes to that soil health. And when looking at the role of livestock, we found that those benefits um, can be achieved and can actually be advanced by including the livestock on that landscape. So grazing those cover crops can introduce a lot more fertility into the landscape. And I know that there's a lot of times concerns regarding soil compaction, um, but as we've monitored some of that soil structure in our treatments, we've seen that we can actually stabilize that soil. And that stabilization sometimes leads to improved water infiltration, um, Maybe we can increase our water holding capacity. And those are all things that are important um, on a year to year basis, especially when we're looking at drier conditions like this year. So um, if, if the grazing animals are managed properly, I think that there's a lot of potential to, to, to maximize those soil health benefits. And Marisol, you work with a lot of types of cover crops and benefits for grazing and soil health. And what are some of the, I guess, the home run species or the ones that you see work so reliably in our area uh, that you'd include in a mix for various goals of, you know, there's building aggregation, nitrogen fixation, erosion protection, or are there some species that are just tried and true and, and work really well? Yeah, um, well, there's some, of course, that work better than others, but um, I also say that mixes are always good. You know, cows need uh, different nutrients, protein, fiber, and so do the microbes in the soil. So they just consider them little animals, <laughs> big animals above and little animals uh, down. So both need a mix. So that's why you, you, they'll need nitrogen, they'll need carbon. 
So I always say um, the idea makes you have at least one plant of each family, a grass, a legume, and some other family like a, like a brassica, you know, like a rape or radish or turnip. Now, in the research that we've done, um, sorghum has done really well for full season cover crops forage um, because, uh, you know, it grows really fast, produces a lot of biomass in the summer, uh, and we need that for the cows. And also it's more drought tolerant than other species. So that's really well. Uh, but you have to be careful not to put too much uh, seed because then it will take over and compete with all other the cover crops. So when you're doing a mix, you have to consider uh, the giving room to all those cover crops so they all can grow and uh, provide the different uh, uh, you know, uh, functions that each one done. So we have to balance the, the seeds so the legumes can fix their nitrogen. And uh, you know, brassicas will produce uh, leaf and uh, biomass, and so it'll be good for both the grazing and then for the soil health because you are uh, adding these uh, nutrients uh, both ways. And when you have grazing cattle, all those nutrients that they eat, a lot of those nutrients, you know, go back in the urine or you know, uh, back to the soil immediately. So it's a it's a very good system. So I really like that. I, and depending in in the winter, it depends. You know, like uh, Aaron was saying, it depends on moisture too. If you're really dry, some species like I, I, I love fava beans for the fall, but uh, if it's dry, it's not going to do that well. So it all depends uh, the type of moisture you have and what you can do. But in the summer, I really like sorghum and mixes with other species. Nice. And, and sorghum is really good for, for building aggregates, right? I mean, that really helps with the soil aggregation because of fibrous roots. Yes, it has, you know, it's a grass, a fibrous root. Uh, and so it, it has association with uh, our vascular mycorrhizae and fungi. And that, so it, you know, a lot of the soil, the fungi produces this sticky substance, so the soil particles can attach to it. So grasses uh, help a lot to get aggregation of soil particles. So it's, it's very good for the soil. Erin, another way to influence soil health is is through different grazing techniques. And you and your brother have started bale grazing on your ranch in Southwest North Dakota. So how's that been working? What are you seeing or what do you expect, expect to see for soil health benefits? Prior to our management, I guess, we were working with some land that um, had been sort of mismanaged to a point where things were just really depleted. Um, different farming practices over the years, different um, management with cattle that left the land just really eroded by both wind and water. And so when we were looking at that resource and trying to figure out how to sort of remediate it back into a productive state and, um, and looking at our options, one of the things that we turned to was bale grazing. Um, you know, it was a way that we could achieve some soil health benefits, but there was other, other factors that went into it for us as producers as well. <coughs> so to bale graze, um, Basically, producers will leave hay that's been baled up out in the field after they've cut it um, so that livestock can graze on that through the fall or the winter months. Now, depending on the number of livestock that you're looking to feed or the duration of grazing that you're trying to achieve, additional hauls can be hauled into the site. They can be stockpiled from one year to the next. Um, I think that's an important thing to point out is that it can be modified to fit the needs of your operation. And that's been really, really helpful for us as we learn about bale grazing. So anyway, these bales that you've either produced at that site or hauled in, um, we spread them out across that landscape, focusing on those areas where we really want to improve the organic matter and have that animal impact on the soil. Um, we'll tip them on end and then we'll use temporary fence materials and we'll create sections that the cattle will graze through. And so they will work their way through that field from one section to the next through that, through that time period. Now you mentioned soil health and that's really our primary goal with this project. So during the first year, um, we actually took that field and we started it off with a multi-species cover crop. And because we had a multi-species cover crop, we grazed that off and then we brought in bales from nearby sites to, to start the bale grazing process. So those cattle grazed the cover crop 
hay was hauled in. And then in the second year of the project, um, we planted it back to a perennial system. And this included alfalfa. Um, there was a nurse crop with flax, wheatgrass, red clover, um, and also some switchgrass that we put into that system. So that hay was harvested on site and then we brought in more hay just to, to, feed, to feed the cattle that we would be bringing into that, to that field. Now, when we did this project, um, we took samples before and after to just monitor um, really the soil nutrients and the response to the impacts of bale grazing. So we took several samples, um, some that were directly under the hay bales where there was livestock grazing, some that were outside of that area where there was no livestock, but the cover crop had been planted. And also within that bale grazing area, but not directly underneath the hay bale. So there was basically three different sampling points. Um, and I think for producers, the first um, nutrients that they really think about is our um, N, P, and K. And when we took those samples, um, we saw a very drastic response um, from our nitrogen, phosphorus, and, potass and potassium by um, looking at the cover crop only and then taking and analyzing the results that were directly underneath the hay bale that had been bale grazed. Our nitrogen numbers jumped from about four pounds per acre to 74 pounds per acre. Phosphorus was um, about four pounds jumping up to 13 and our potassium went from 200 to about 800 parts per million. So um, I want to point out though that I think part of the reason we were seeing that dramatic response is because that soil had been so depleted. Um, and so we're just starting to really waken it up. Um, and I could really see that looking at our organic matter levels because nothing was really responding in terms of organic matter. And I didn't necessarily expect it to because of how biologically inactive that soil had been. But now we wanna take those acres and sort of spread out our impact to see if we can continue to expedite that process um, because we've been so happy with the response and the forage production. And just, you know, when we go out and cut that hay in the, the following years, the regrowth of those grasses and those forbs is um, much quicker to respond. There's a lot more vegetative growth than the areas that haven't had that impact. So now we wanna to continue to distribute it out. Aaron, do you have any tips for producers that might be interested in, in starting bale grazing and specifically focus on selecting a site that's appropriate? I think first of all, you know, you need to consider um, what you're even interested in doing with it. So for us, it was a, a practice to renovate our hayland acres um, and knowing the types of hay that we would be bringing in, you know, that's not something we would really consider doing on native acres, for instance. And so um, take a look at your resources, consider what you're working with, um, and don't, don't be afraid to start on a small scale either. Um, Maybe it's doing something for a week, a week long bale grazing strategy so you can go on vacation or you can go um, and have a couple days visiting your son or kids. Um, don't be afraid to start small and just sort of gradually work your way into the process of bale grazing. I, as I remember, this this bale grazing site you had was right on the highway, right? So a lot of people drove by and saw it. And and what were some of the questions that you got from from neighbors about the practice or or things that they were curious about in doing bale grazing? A lot of times, um, to be honest, we didn't necessarily get the questions directly to us, at least to start with. Um, there was a lot of people that sort of would um, wonder what we were doing, and we could hear those conversations, whether it was at the sale barn or at the coffee shop. And they, you know, would comment on, did you see that family with all the cattle out in their hay fields? What the heck are they doing? Um, but over time, we found that people were more, more up, open to approaching us on like a one-on-one -on -one basis. And so um, I think that's something that my brother and I have enjoyed doing um, is inviting people out to just come and watch and see what we're doing. Um, but it was definitely a little vulnerable for us to, to start it, especially on a field so close to the highway, like you said. Um, it 
kind of makes you feel exposed and you're never quite sure how things are going to go. But, um, you know, it's interesting because we started at that field by the highway um, and we've gotten to a point where um, we've really liked what we're doing. And so we're starting to rotate and use it on other fields. And it's interesting because some people have seen that we are no longer doing it on the highway. And they assume that that's because it didn't go well. And because it was a bad, bad winter feeding strategy. And, and, and now they're wondering, well, what else are you doing? Are you getting out in your tractor and hauling hay to the cattle? And it's like, no, we're actually, we're actually rotating it out to other fields so that we can um, spread out that impact. Nice. Well, yeah, as soon as you start applying one practice that you're trying on one field to the other fields, that, that shows that it's really something that's working well for your, for your ranch. And, you know, there's another approach that Marisol has been looking at and evaluating, and that's including perennials in an annual cropping rotation. And, and so that's oftentimes alfalfa intercropped in corn is one way to sneak in perennials effectively. Uh, but what are some of those soil benefits and other environmental benefits, Marisol, of using a perennial rotation that, uh, that we can do in the Northern Plains and that is, you know, other opportunities for perennials in our rotations here too. Yeah, um, well, perennials, I always uh, teach my students uh, the importance of having perennials on your system. Unfortunately, over the time, you know, we lost a lot of perennials from our landscape and you know, went to only annual crops rotations. Perennials, um, you know, make systems more resilient and stable over time. Uh, and the reason for that is perennial roots can go deep in the soil. Grasses will uh, sequester carbon into the soil. And then uh, legumes like alfalfa, alfalfa uh, roots can go really deep and can get water. And, and also uh, they improve infiltration and aggregation because they're putting all those nutrients every year, you know, in the system. So the, the research that we've been doing for alfalfa corn, uh, it kind of, it's, it's a way to try to get farmers that grow corn to maybe uh, start growing alfalfa. One of the reasons they don't grow uh, alfalfa is because alfalfa in the seeding year is very low produ production, very low. And because of that, uh, you know, it's economically, it's very hard to convince them that you can produce a corn silage uh, versus the alfalfa that's going to produce very little. So. If you establish it with corn, you still get corn. You're going to hear heat in, in the grain a little bit if it's for grain or silage too. But then you get it established. So it's, it's better economically to do that. So really what we're doing is how we can get perennials back into the system, you know, make it economic for the farmers. Now grasses too, and, and like Gary was saying, they have a, a, a field now with perennials, right? With forbs and grasses and they have warm and cool season grasses she mentioned. And uh, yeah, the thing is, if we get in a drought, when you have perennials and you have a mix of different perennials, uh, those soils are going to fare much better than in, in, a, in a soil where you have an annual rotation. And it's because of the different depths of roots and the different uh, way the nutrient cycle when you have those mixes. You know, you have to think uh, perennials, uh, their role in their life cycle is to survive the winter and keep going over the years. So they put a lot of nutrients and carbohydrates, starch and, and proteins down in the root system to survive. So many years, even some, some of the perennial grasses, they take a while to establish and it's because the plant is sending everything down, you know, and so usually in the establishment year of like a broom or or switch grass, uh, you won't get much yield for the cows. But over time, the system starts balancing itself. And it's because the plant will focus on putting things down on the soil as establishes. And after that, it'll produce that. Yeah, you get a, and, and as you add carbon or organic matter into the soil, because those roots every year in the winter, some of those roots die, decay, you, you get a lot more nutrient cycling over the time. And so the soil in that increased aggregation, so improves the whole soil health, which makes the system more resilient and stable over time and not so uh, affected by changes in weather. One year we got a lot of drought, the other year we're too wet. Usually soils that have perennials, it's, you, you never get them flooded and super wet because they have such a good structure that the 
when you get a rain events, the water just moves through the profile because of the excellent structure that the roots of those crops and the, um, you know, provide. And that's why, so the alfalfa corn system is, is just trying to get people that eat and they are in an annual system to move slowly to put at least one perennial, which is alfalfa. So we have a question on what can you do to remediate a field that has become mostly brome, which is difficult to get rid of. Um, and so I can start, but I'll let and turn it over for others to elaborate. Um, and I think that depends on what type of field. Um, is it is it native rangeland that has brome grass in? Is it a pasture? And what the other species are in that in that field or mix? Um, if it's native rangeland, there's a lot of research that brome is actually can be easily controlled with grazing management. If rep repetitive early season grazing, you can back brome off, which is great news, especially when we compare it to things like Kentucky bluegrass, which is much more difficult to get rid of. Um, but if the other species in there are also early season, that might might change it and you might have to maybe dig it up and start new. So it, it really depends on the context of, of the field and what else is going on there. Um, Marisol, do you have any thoughts to add? Yeah, Brom, you know, it was introduced to the state because it's super winter hardy. But uh, yeah, it's very vigorous, the rhizome, so it's, it's hard to, it starts taking over everything. And it's not even good for birds. And so, uh, yeah, like Miranda said, grazing is a way to get rid of it. Or you might want to start over, uh, you know, kill it with herbicides over time and then put something else to get a better pasture. But it, it, it is hard, this vigorously rhizomatous will take over and pretty much smother any other species. So uh, a lot of people have planted wrong with alfalfa, having an alfalfa grass mi mixture. But after, after a few years, you start losing the alfalfa due to winter injury, and then you end up with just wrong. But it's not, a, it's not that easy once you have it. So now we're recommending that if you are establishing new alfalfa grass mixtures or grass mixtures, try to stay away from smooth brome. And there are other grasses, even meadow brome is, is much better and it's not as vigorous uh, rhizomatous like uh, smooth brome. So there are other grasses, there are better selections than smooth brome. Uh, so we, I think over time, if we can start getting rid of it, it's a good thing. We also can't ignore climatic conditions. We've been getting lots of questions. I know our county extension agents and us as specialists about, you know, specifically drought and what to expect for 2021 graze, growing and grazing season. And so we want to spend some time talking about that a little bit more. Um, just immediate concerns that um, we've been that have been brought to our attention and looking back at past droughts is, oh, we had a pretty significant fall drought across much of the state, and there's a lot of data showing from past droughts that we should expect a delay and forage production, forage growth in our pastures and rangelands this spring. And to be prepared for on, on a normal scenario, if we get normal precipitation, that we, we should expect at least a 20% decrease in forage production this year. And that's not even considering if the drought continues. Um, and so what are some, we want, you know, want to think about some of those options in terms of a surplus forage and supplemental forages that we can utilize to offset that depletion in our forage resources. Um, and Aaron, I know you're, you're, you're adjusting to dry conditions on your ranch and then also with uh, research at, out at Streeter, you know, what are the, some of the changes that you're, you're making in, in both settings to account for that potential drought this, this growing season? Yeah, so there's a lot to consider when it comes to drought management and I think it's really important to plan before, during, and after that drought to manage those resources. Um, I also think it's necessary as a producer to really just take an honest assessment of your resources, look at the capabilities, the limitations, um, even just, I mean, have a really good sense of your financial situation as well. Um, from a grassland perspective, you know, the degree to which drought impairs the range depends on a few different factors like the intensity of grazing, 
how often you're grazing or rotating on and off that system and the timing of grazing. So um, at the research station, you know, Miranda indicated that a lot of our turnout dates this year might have to be delayed. And that's definitely the case at Streeter. Um, last year, we used up a lot of that subsoil moisture that we had to sort of get through the season. Um, we were pretty short on moisture last year as well. And so because that subsoil moisture has been used up, um, our plant emergence is gonna be really slow this spring. And when we look at turning animals out into that grazing system, we really wanna protect those growth nodes as they begin to develop. Because once we damage them, once we remove that meristem, you know, their ability to respond and um, regrow for continued years, use throughout that growing season is gonna be limited. So, um, you know, we could have a whole hour conversation on drought management strategies, um, but I, th I think being creative with some of your strategies, whether it's looking into your cattle records, really taking a serious look at your animals and, and calling those ones that you've thought twice about before and didn't take to town. Um, I know for crop producers, continuing to implement those practices that do promote soil health, um, whether it's through cover crops or a different type of rotation strategy, those are all things that are gonna help you mitigate that financial risk. Um, and recognize that even if you're interested in something like cover crops, you know, maybe this isn't the year to go ahead and do that, but keep it in the back of your mind. Um, look at the costs of seed help that or have that be a factor into some of the decisions that you make as you move forward in this growing season. That's great advice. And, and Marisol, maybe you can add, add some more to that. You know, if, if you are going to use cover crops, maybe you're a part of a program or something like that, where you need to include cover crops in rotation, what, what should you focus on to make sure that that's as a successful establishment as it can be uh, when, when seeding a cover crop? You know, we never know exactly when we're, we're going to have a drought and if we, uh, one thing is, is how you're gonna see it, right? If, if um, drilling is always gonna be better. So some people that's aerial seeding or broadcasting, but seed to soil contact, you get some moisture. And so that's gonna make any emergence of a cover crop better. Okay, now um, there's two sides, right? We are the spring and the fall. In the spring, I was gonna say, just if you already plant the cover crops, they're winter hardy like rye, uh, just watch if if you're planting another annual forage or you are planting an annual crop, uh, watch for the water use. Uh, we're, we might have a drought this year, so you might have to terminate those cover crops if you have rye early enough. We've seen in the research that sometimes you let a crop go, it'll use too much water and it'll hurt the next crop, whether you're putting alfalfa next or another forage or a crop. So you have to watch for winter crops, especially in a season where we know we already had a really dry fall. And so is that. Now, in, in, when you're planting in the spring, um, try to choose some species that'll take a little more drought or unlike sorghum, I mentioned that at least you'll get some forage, um, you know, and, and try to avoid those. They use a lot of water. So many of the legumes like clovers and stuff, those like red clover loves water. So uh, if it's going to be dry, try to stay away and use more grasses. Millets are good for drought too, and you'll get some forage. Um, so I would just manage it and, and, and like Karen was saying, you have to mitigate the risk. So you still need forage, uh, but you have to calculate, okay, I can do these crops. And even if I have a drought, I might be able to get a few tons of, uh, you know, hay or, or silage or something so I can feed these many animals. Um, yeah, like the perennial crops, the perennial crops, even the drought, are just going to shut down. They don't die. I get a lot of calls on alfalfa. My alfalfa is dead. I say, it's not dead. It's just alfalfa. If it doesn't have water, it doesn't grow. Um, but uh, uh, so they just shut down on their own when they don't have water. And alfalfa is a very heavy water user. So if we, if the, all the forecast says that we're going to have a drought, you have to uh, prepare and, you know, have some cover crops there we call it like summer emergency hay or forage that you can do that. Now in the spring, usually we get some moisture. So 
maybe you can um, collect on that and plant some uh, spring cereals like oat or oat pea mix, because that'll say, you know, I'll produce a few bales of quality hay that you can use in case your pastures are not producing. So there's several things that you can do, but you know, it's never like, there's no rule or one thing to do. You have to play around, uh, you know, the time, the forecast and what's happening. Cereals um, and those being a good option for in drought and they, yeah, definitely a good option, but just if you're using, if you're gonna plant those and plan on using those for forage, be aware of potential toxicity issues, specifically nitrate toxicity and be testing those forages before you feed them. Yeah, that's a good point, Miranda. See, the thing is, if you plant them for forage and don't fertilize them high, you shouldn't have that problem. The problem is sometimes people uh, have them as a crop. It's gonna be a wheat crop or a corn crop. And because they have they run out of forage all the time, they wanna use all these crops. And that's when it's, that's a very good point because we have that problem where people want to start feeding anything, you know, that looks green. I've got call that people want to feed flax or any any crop, and you have to watch it because, uh, especially if you put a high nitrogen rates, those crops will will have probably high nitrogen. So you have to test them before using them. So that's a very good point. <laughs> now, if you plant the forage for using it in the spring, you're probably not going to put high nitrogen rates. You should be safer because it's a plant forage. It's when it's an unplanned forage when it's more risk. There was a question as well about um, concerns regarding alfalfa um, reducing soil water availability in the dry seasons if you're going to intercrop it with corn marisol. Alfalfa is a, a water user and we've done this uh, this is system of alfalfa corn intercropping and if you get a really dry year it will hurt the corn more. You know they, it does compete with water for the corn we're planting them at the same time so uh, we usually get 20 to 30 bushels reduction in corn, uh, even if you wouldn't have a drought. If you get a drought, yet that reduction is even going to be uh, more. So the thing is, is the system, you, you can't look at it as a one-year system. You have to look at it as a, a system approach of two years. So even if you lose uh, some by establishing the alfalfa with a corn, even if you get 50 bushels less, what the alfalfa is going to produce the next year as the first production year is more than they lose in the corn. But they, they do compete. They do compete a lot. And that's why we're also working on the 60-inch corn, because we think in the 60-inch corn, the alfalfa will have more room to compete on its own <laughs> and take less from the, from the corn. But we don't know that yet. So that's another alternative of not having. But when you have it on 30-inch corn and you got a drought, the corn is going to suffer. Alfalfa is a, bit, a heavy water user. Mm. You mentioned, um, you know, some of the the toxicity issues with the cover crops potentially in a drought. And and Miranda, are there any other issues with like with water sources or anything like that that may become more of a concern in a drought as well? Uh, yeah. Uh, so I'm going to put a plug in right now that we're doing a drought webinar series that it's Thursdays at one. Um, so if you go to the NDSU Extension Drought website, you'll find out more information. And on March 4th, we will be talking about water quality. This week, we're talking about supplemental forage. So we'll, it'll expand a little bit on, on the conversation we've started today. Um, but North Dakota, even last fall, we already had high total dissolved salt, solids or salt, the salt component and sulfates in many of our water sources across the state. And so it's gonna be really important going into this growing season, knowing that we don't have much runoff coming into those sources from, from snow melts and so we need to monitor and test those. And so we have some really good tools that I've been promoting. Our, many of our county extension offices have them, um, which is a handheld TDS meter. They're around $80 for a good one. And then sulfate test strips. And you can get a pack of 100 for $40 on Amazon. And so those are some nice tools that you can monitor on your, on your own ranch yourself. It seems like there's a lot to be concerned with when we go into a drought and, and ways to manage. Let's see, what populations are you using in, in 60 versus 30 inch rows for corn and alfalfa? Um, that will go to Marisol. You know, with the corn alfalfa we're doing, we're actually keeping the same population of about 34,000 plants per acre, whether you put it on 30 or 60. So that means that you have more corn plants in the row, right? They're a lot closer to each other. So you still keep that. Um, 
Dr. Ransom, Joe Ransom, the ones with corn, and they've been doing the 16-inch corns with cover crops. They they try different populations, the 34,000, 17. But when you put a 17,000, that means you reduce the population in the row, uh, you decrease yield quite a bit. So, so what we're trying to do with 16-inch corn is keep the same population you would use at 30. It's just more plants in the row. Aaron, is there anything that we missed in, in this conversation that you wanted to make sure people knew about? I think going back to um, the question about um, the field that's inundated with lots of brome grass, um, those are things that we think about when we're bale grazing. And I just wanted to mention that, you know, we have to think about the type of hay that we're bringing into that environment. Um, the the Harvested hay is going to introduce some species, so you need to keep that in mind and also just think about what's in that soil, um, what's in that top layer of the soil and what things might you sort of reactivate um, into, into the plant production. And so um, we've been able to remediate some of those expired hay fields that have been really inundated with brome grasses. Um, the, uh, the addition of that organic matter that's holding that moisture at the surface has allowed us to really bring back a lot of those intermediate wheat grasses, um, some of those things that we hadn't seen on that site for a long time. So that's a part of the decision making process for what bales we're bringing into an area and why we're doing it as well. And then Marisol, is there anything that, that you can think of that we didn't cover that you'd like to mention? When choosing cover crops for grazing, also, you know, think of what it's going to produce and uh, what your cows need for protein to make your mixes and, uh, you know, just to make a decision and calculate so you can calculate how much forage you're going to have uh, for the number of cows you have. So uh, Miranda has fantastic uh, extension uh, volatiles and uh, pages and app to do that so uh, you can benefit from that. How about you Miranda? Is there anything else that you can think of that we missed? I think the biggest thing is if you're just starting out in in grazing cover crops you know work with a rancher you know build those partnerships and that's a lot of what we talk about during during these soil health um, talks that we have and different events is build those partnerships so that you're not taking on a big risk a new venture without knowing how it's going to work for you so starting small um, starting with something, a mix, maybe a simple mix that you're comfortable with, that's cost effective for you, especially a year like this year where we're going to be a little drier and it's a little bit more of a risk that you're taking. And, you know, contact your extension agent, contact extension specialist if you have any questions as you're moving forward through the process. So we have a ton of resources, as Marisol, Marisol said and we're happy to help you through that process as best we can. We have a couple of resources. We just updated our cover crops for annual cover crops for grazing and haying publication. And that is on our NDSU extension website, as well as we have a cover crop cost calculator. So you can kind of play around with those different mixes and see what, the, what switching some of those species out would look like for you financially. We are not done yet. So uh, we are gonna go on to our Tech Talk segment, uh, which this week it's John Brecker and Jody Bowe with AgVice Laboratories. They're gonna join us. And how about you guys introduce yourself? John, can you start? My name is John Brecker and I'm a soil scientist here at, at AgVice Laboratories. Um, I grew up in Southeast North Dakota on a, on a corn, wheat and soybean farm. Got rid of the livestock though a, a few years before I was growing up. Um, after that, I uh, did my bachelor's and master's at NDSU, and I worked with Dave Franzen on revising the corn potassium recommendations a few years ago. And since then, I've been up here in Northwood um, at Eggvice. Great. Thanks for joining us. And how about you, Jody? Can you do a quick introduction too? I am Jody Bow. I'm an agronomist here with Eggvice Laboratories in Northwood. Um, also, grew up in North Dakota. Um, besides being an agronomist for Eggvice here, um, I also farm with my dad and brother. Um, after moving back to North Dakota last year. So really excited and look forward to this conversation. Great, well, thank you for joining us. Let's let's start off here, uh, John, the first question's for you about, we've been talking about kind of fine tuning these systems, right? I mean, we're adding in perennials, we're looking at things like bale grazing, um, cover crops as well. And as we, as we manage these systems more intensively, um, the same can probably be said for, for soil testing and management, right? As we intensify our systems, we need to maybe intensify or adjust our sampling protocols. And what are some of the recommendations you have for soil testing and interpretation of those tests as we work towards these new systems uh, to make them more precise? Right, kind of the whole discussion today has been about trying to tailor your management practices to the landscape that 
that you've been dealt with, whether it was what your great grandfather had moved to and settled um, or what you happened to pick up, uh, you know, a year or two ago. So as we know, landscapes vary and soil properties and nutrients vary across that whole landscape. So kind of the, the next step in being better at soil management, whether it's for soil health or soil nutrients, is precision soil sampling, which we more commonly refer to as grid and zone sampling. So this is kind of like the classic way that we've always done soil sampling, having you know a quarter section and trying to get one soil sample across that whole area. And when you do that, you try to hit the, the main um, landscape features and you avoid the saline areas, you avoid the sandy eroded ridges and knobs. And so what you end up with is a soil sample pretty much targeted for like mid slope positions, you know, that average, you know, and that's a great way to get started. It's, you know, it's, it's better than a guess, but it doesn't take us to that next step of actually knowing where we need to target nutrient management. And maybe we have some saline areas and if like we're trying perennials to manage some of these salty areas because, you know, we can't grow crops very well. A precision soil sample is kind of needed to carve out that area or that sandy ridge. Maybe we're in Western North Dakota and we have a low pH spot. Um, zone sampling is that next step. And so to give you an idea of how valuable zone soil sampling is, uh, actually summarized a bunch of the soil sample data that we had gotten um, from the region this past year. And what we did is we looked at the average range in soil test values within a field. So we took the, like the high testing zone and subtracted the low testing zone and found out what is that average distance or that average difference between those zones across a whole range of fields in our area. And we broke this out based on the number of zones within a field. So say you had a zone with, um, or a field with three zones you know, the average range in soil test nitrate, for example, is 27 pounds. And as we increase the number of zones, we're able to capture more and more variability. And if, if you got really carried away and even had an eight zone field, between that high and low testing zone, you could find a range of 60 pounds of nitrate or more. So, I mean, that's a lot of nutrients that you could potentially manage in a, in a better way just by soil sampling with precision soil samples. Before, it would just kind of mass them all together if you were just running with that one field composite. And you know, we've been talking, I know you had some sessions before about problematic soils, um, looking at pH and the electrical conductivity in some of these fields where, you know, you have a three zone field, you might have a pH difference of 0.5. And as you get into some of these, into more and more zones in a field, all of a sudden we're starting to reveal big differences in soil pH and big differences in salinity. And depending on where those are, we're gonna to wanna to target them with very different management strategies. Jody, we've mentioned perennials and rotation and often going with perennials on some of those identified problematic areas is, is the way to go. What are you seeing as a good fit for these? Thinking specifically about those areas that are saline, um, again, managing soil salinity is all about managing soil moisture. Um, and so in a lot of areas, tile drainage um, is just not an option um, in managing that soil water. And so changing from a cropping system of annual crops to perennial crops might just be the way to go. And so perennial forages, specifically those that suck up a lot of water can do a great job at preventing further salt accumulation and also making sure to prevent um, that saline area from growing in size in that landscape. And so if you're thinking about putting in a perennial forage of some sort, um, looking at either forage grasses or perennial um, legumes, um, you're really going to want to go with a perennial grass. Um, right now there just isn't a whole lot of forage legumes available that are very saline tolerant. Um, so again, what you're gonna be looking at is um, some grasses for those areas. And so a common forage grass, perennial forage grass mixture that you're gonna find for here in North Dakota is gonna be a five-way mixture um, um, if each equal parts of a hybrid called AC Saltlander green wheatgrass, um, slender wheatgrass, western wheatgrass, intermediate wheatgrass, and then smooth grown grass. Um, and then what's really great about these perennial systems versus an annual system is that these perennial forages will be taking up water um, throughout the growing season. Um, and during the time where typically you'd be establishing an annual crop, you'll have the perennial forage there 
um, taking up water and removing it from um, the root zone. And same thing with at the end of the season, instead of um, switching to physiological maturity um, and stop taking up the water with the annual system, um, you'll be able to still suck up water with that perennial forage. Um, and so what's really important about um, switching to a perennial forage system um, is a couple of things. So first, knowing what you're starting with um, and knowing the soil that you're starting with. So it's gonna be key to do a soil test to determine what your baseline salinity or your electrical conductivity is and figure out um, where you wanna go, how much you wanna reduce that by. Again, if you're going to some sort of seed dealer to buy a perennial forage, you're gonna to wanna to know what the EC is. Um, so that salesperson or that seed seller is gonna to wanna to know what that EC number is. Um, further, we've all talked about, uh, we've probably heard the saying before, you can't manage what you don't measure. Um, and so it's gonna be really important as you switch to that perennial forage system um, to keep monitoring that EC and looking at all right, is the EC staying the same? Is it going down? Um, and if you're asking the question, you know, is it time to move from a perennial forage back to an annual system with maybe a salt tolerant crop like barley? Um, do I have an EC that's low enough to go back to that, um, that annual crop? I hear Marisol say often too about, about these perennial systems is that treat them like you would an annual cropping system. You're gonna be soil testing. You're gonna be making sure that you're applying the appropriate fertility to these systems. And as far as like seeding a perennial, I mean, John, are you going right up to the to the line where you have that sandy ridge line? Are you overshooting it a little bit with these systems, or how are you kind of managing it to make sure you don't have an issue that spreads uh, or causes other issues throughout the field? Right, so a good example of that is is really kind of the salty ones because um, you can see right where that salt line usually is in a field, and unfortunately, water doesn't stop right at that line. You know, it kind of will keep convecting out a little bit. So you, you gotta have a buffer that goes a little bit beyond where you see that problem right now. The other thing is usually some of these salty areas, it gets really wet. So you kind of do wanna have a little bit of a buffer to work on too, to give you some headlands to play around with. And then it also allows you to kind of smooth out some of these ends. Um, because when we think about turning around on headlands, you wanna have nice uniform edges to work with. So you, you don't always just kind of wanna back it up to right where those you know, what, what I'll call the natural variations exist. You want to make it something that's manageable and workable in your system. And if that means grasses that you can hay, excellent. If that means something you can fence in and graze for the long term, even better. Okay, so would the same kind of apply for like soil amendments? Say you have a low pH soil and you're adding some lime to that system to to improve, you know, raise the pH. Is that is that a similar approach where you're looking for these variable places across the field and just spot applying the, the amendments? With the low pH one in particular, the cost of liming is so expensive. You, you really have to manage those in a precision context because if you're not just putting on a couple hundred pounds of lime, you're putting on tons of lime and, and just the transportation costs, everything, it adds up. So but when you get these zone maps, yeah, you're going to want to be very judicious with, with how you use it and how you apply it in these areas because getting too carried away in that context ends up costing a lot more. So in the case of liming, I usually like to try to rein it back a little bit okay. because there okay. it is a real capital investment um, that you have to amortize, you know, not over just a couple of years, but probably over 10 or 15 years.